a lot of classes in experiments and causal inference turn out to t talk a lot about statistics. Sometimes students wonder, why are we talking about so much about statistics? I came here to learn about experiments. So today, this, is a, this, this little lecture is about the relationship between statistics and causal inference, in particular, the relationship between the statistical ideas of two guys, Jersey Neyman and Ronald Fisher, um, and causal inference in the context of an experiment. My name is Jake Bowers, and you can learn more about me uh, at that uh, website below. So imagine that I'm a farmer and I'm trying to grow some uh, vegetables. I have four plots of land and um, I have randomly assigned two plots of land to, uh, to fertilizer. And I'm wondering whether the fertilizer has an effect on my, on my vegetables. In particular, this summer in my own home garden, I am growing okra, which is my favorite vegetable. And I'm wondering how I can get more okra. If I'm, if I'm organized, I might start to collect some data for example, I might label my fields, so field A and field B. I might, um, uh, uh, you know, record how much uh, how much okra I got after I put on the fertilizer in field A. Say twenty one pieces of okra. Um, here I got five okra pieces of okra from uh, field D, which was also received the fertilizer, and eleven. Uh, okras from field B and nine from field C. The sad thing about okra is that they you often you want to eat them by the handful, but they often only grow individually on on plants. So this is kind of where um, I might be as a farmer, and I might be wondering what's the causal effect. You know, did did the uh, fertilizer make a, make a difference? Now I might ask uh, two statisticians about this. This is Jersey Neyman, and this is Ronald Fisher. If I said, well what is the a causal effect of fertilizer on field A, they'd say we don't know because we only see field A after you put the fertilizer on it. Not, uh, in, in, we don't see field A's output um, in the situation where you didn't put any fertilizer on it. And they make a, uh, they expand the table. They, this is what we observe over here. But here we see, this is what we saw. These are, we, this is what we do see. We, these are the counterfactual causal conditions or potential outcomes. We see 21 okras uh, when uh, field A got fertilizer, but we don't know how many okras field A would have produced had it not received fertilizer. Same thing, we don't, in field B, we don't know how it would have done if we had given it fertilizer. Maybe it would have had more or less than what we saw. What we saw were, was its uh, outcome in the control condition, the condition with no fertilizer of having 11 okras. And if the effect, which we write tau, uh, for each field um, is the difference between these two counterfactual conditions, the conditions where we don't know, you know, where, where uh, you know, the, the two potential outcomes, um, we don't know the answer to this. It's, it's unobservable. And you can't go back and take away the fertilizer from a, a field A because now it's a, you know, that's a field that has had fertilizer and that's been taken away. That's different from the field that has never had fertilizer. So how do we handle this problem? How do we learn about the fact that we, about these unobserved values here when we in some senses can't observe them, but if, but observing them is, is necessary for us to be able to learn or learning about them, inferring about them is necessary for us to be able to give advice to the farmer about fertilizer. And, and today I wanna to talk about the two main approaches to this uh, that um, I'm, I'm affiliating with Naaman uh, and Fisher, although when they wrote their papers in the 1920s and 1930s, they, they weren't imagining uh, cartoons uh, drawn as I have drawn them here. So if here's what Naaman would say, and there's a lot going on, but let's start at the top of this. So here we see the fields and Naaman is looking at the fields. And Naaman says, I don't know about the individual causal effects, as in for field A, he says, I can't know. Uh, the answer about whether field A would have had more or less okra with, if, with, with or without fertilizer. But, he says, I can help you estimate the average causal effect. Okay, so here's the, uh, the, the really useful idea that, that he proposes here. He says, now, let's think about all these individual causal effects, tau A, B, C, and D, and we don't know them. We'll define the average of them as just the sum of them over four. That's the average causal effect. And then 
we start to, we if you start to notice you notice that tau a is just the subtract is just a, a we just subtract off what we would have seen for a with what we would have under under control with, with what we did see for a under treatment and similarly for b and c and d and if we if if that's the case we can rewrite this average in this following way which is the average of of all the effects the, the average okra we would have seen under treatment minus the average okra we would have seen under control okay so this is just a little bit of of math that allows us to express this average of effects in terms of in terms of differences of potential outcomes okay so far this is just him defining an average causal effect and you might be saying well fine but we don't observe all of this stuff Naaman. how do we how do we learn use what we observe to learn about what we don't observe so we we know that you can simplify your notation and, and from thinking about the average causal effect as an average of the unobserved causal effects or the av the difference between two unobserved things we don't know the average effect among the treated or and we don't know the average effect among all the controls but now there's something interesting here notice we do have two observations of two treated fields and we also have two treated two control fields so we have some information about each one of these quantities okay and what he shows is that i can he can estimate the average effect the average outcome, the average number of okra that we would get if uh, under treatment, and we can estimate the average amount of okra we'd get under control using the existing data. In fact, the average of the fields, pro, pro, uh, you know, fields okra under treatment, and the average of the observed fields okra under control. Each of these it turns out is a good estimator of these unobserved. Um, quantities. And so we get an estimate three. Okay, so Naaman's response to the farmer is, um, I can't tell you about the effect on field A, field B, field C, or field, field D, but I can tell you that the that on average, the effect is three. Now, the farmer probably will also say, is that a good estimator? And, and Naaman can say, in fact, it is a good estimator. It's an unbiased estimator because if, if you randomized, and we can show other things about that, but we'll learn about estimators and their properties later. Okay, now what about Fisher? Back to the back to the uh, the farmer asking the question and Fisher also saying the same thing as Naaman. I don't know what the effect is on A. But Fisher has a different idea. Fisher says, I don't know about the individual causal effects, but I can help you test your ideas or your hypotheses about them. So he might say, well, tell me what you think the effect might be. And the farmer might say, well, for example, here's here's one possible idea, which is that uh, it doesn't matter. The, the, the fertilizer is a waste of my money. Um, whether or not I had put fertilizer on, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, field A, I would have seen 21 okras. Whether or, And if I had put it on B, I would have seen 11 okras. Right, so that's the that's the criticism. The idea is that maybe it wasn't worth buying the buying the far, the fertilizer, um, and uh, and and if you want to, you and so you have to confront that criticism. Is it is it worth its time? Okay, worth it. Was it worth worth buying? Well, if it was not worth buying, then we know what we would see. In fact, we would see the same exact number of okra regardless of what condition you're in. And so these little thought bubbles show us that you can actually fill in, you can make a claim about how things might have turned out without treatment. For example, if, under the claim that nothing, that the treatment doesn't matter. Okay. And if that's the case, you can start to connect up what you see with what you are, with what you don't see. We do see, for example, we see for each individual, the, their, the treatment, the uh, potential outcome, that we uh, that we would have seen uh, depending on their treatment status. So for field A, we see 21 okra, and that is the okra that we would have seen under treatment because it was in treatment. Okay, so we have this little bit of math that tells us that. So T is one for field A, and so we see 21 here, and this becomes zero. Now, if we were correct about our our hype our idea, or you know, if, let's taking taking our idea seriously, that means that 
y1 is the same as y0 for everybody. It doesn't matter. There's no effect. And if that's the case, we can plug that in and we can say that what we observe is exactly what we would have seen in the control condition. Under this idea, or this claim, or this hypothesis, this hypothesis implies, this is, it's a hypothesis about each individual field here, and this hypothesis implies that what we observe is what we would have seen without treatment. Okay, so now we're beginning to make the link to from observed to unobserved. Okay, so we have an idea. The hypothesis implies that the observed is what we would have seen under control. Now, let's use some of our data to talk about, well, how compatible, you know, what, what is, what, what, are, what, what kind of uh, data patterns are compatible, are compatible with this idea. So for example, this data pattern, 21 plus five, which is 21 plus five minus 11 uh, plus nine, which is the observed treated minus the observed control, this number three, it's compatible with the null of no effects, right? Because that's what we would have seen if there were no effects. Turns out that, that, but A and D were only treated by chance. It could have been A and B were treated because remember the farmer chose to treat the different fields by chance. If A and B were treated then under the null of no effects, we would have seen this difference of means. If they were treat, if C and D were treated, we would have seen this difference of means, negative nine. So there's a variety of ways that these numbers, 21, 11, nine, and five, uh, might have come out. I mean, there, we, we would always see those numbers, but the difference of, say, difference of means between the treated and the controls might be different, um, even if there were no effects. Okay, so that's another insight here. Okay, so we have, we have our hypothesis or idea. We have the implication of the hypothesis for what we observe. And if we have some test statistic, some data summary that summarizes the treatment to outcome relationship like a difference of means, um, it turns out that that if there were no effects and this was the treatment, A and B, D were treated, we'd see a three. If there were no effects and A and B were treated, we'd see a nine. We'd see a seven if A and C were treated, etc. There are three, there are six different um, ways that a difference of means between the treated and controls would have come out, could, could, could come out if there really were no effects. And it turns out that there's only six ways. There are six total ways for us to have, to, to, to look at differences between treated and controls in, um, in regards okra uh, production um, uh, in, this, in this research design. These are all, in this, in this experiment, no effects means this, these numbers, these are all compatible with there being no, with this idea that we began with. And because we randomly assigned in the beginning A and D, then it's equally likely that we would have gotten A and D or A and B or A and C, etc. So each one of these numbers is equally likely to have been seen if there were no effects. Okay, that's what randomization gives us, which then lets us convert this this these set of numbers into a probability distribution. This doesn't look like your ordinary uh, smooth probability distribution, but this is the probability of seeing a negative nine uh, in the world where there's no effects. And this is the probability of seeing a three uh, in the world of no effects. It turns out to be one sixth for each of them. And then Fisher says, well, look, um, the, the probability of observing of a value, so we observe three as our difference of means. Um, in the world where there's no effects, and uh, you know, following the idea that that we began with about the unobserved effect, uh, the unobserved relationships, um, we see that the probability of seeing something as big as or larger than three is 0 0.5, three out of six. Okay, so Fisher is allow is this is a p-value, and Fisher has allowed us to. Um, use a testing procedure to learn about the causal effects, uh, in particular a claim about the causal effects, um, uh, even though we, we don't observe them. So the procedure is we, you know, compare the observed to the imply, what, what, what we implied, compare the observed test statistic, number three in this case, to the implied test statistic, the implied by 
by the, the, the null hypothesis using a p-value. And then later on, the farmer might say, is this a good test? And Fisher can say, yes, this is a good test. You will not mislead yourself uh, with this test if you use this test, test a lot. So there we go. You can sort of, you can see that there are two different ways to, um, that are common ways to learn about um, the effects of, the causal effects of experiments. One comes from uh, Fisher and involves a p-values and one comes from Neyman involves estimation. And that's why we use statistics to learn about causal effects uh, in experiments.